it's time for another episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas, the podcast covering the intersection of business, culture, entrepreneurship, and life in general here in the Ozarks. Whether you are considering a move to this area or trying to learn more about the place you call home, we've got something special for you. Here's our host, Randy Wilbur. Hey folks, and welcome back to another episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. I'm your host, Randy Wilbur, and I'm excited to be with you today. As always, I've got a great episode for you. This episode's actually being recorded over the interwebs, and I'm actually looking at my guest as opposed to being in the studios at KUAF. And so this is a different kind of experience. We're actually recording this for both video and audio. Primarily, you will hear this as an audio, but we may put the video out at some point in time. But I'm excited today to bring my guest on, and she's somebody that I befriended since she moved here originally uh, in Northwest Arkansas, I want to say maybe a year and a half, maybe two years ago, or maybe it could have been longer. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not good with public math, but regardless, Anella Malik is an amazing storyteller. I would call her an influencer. I would also call her a travelogue someone that is able to kind of go out and share with the world her reflections on different corners of the world. And most recently, I saw her take a plunge in Antarctica that I was like, man, I like cold showers, but I don't know if I could do that to, I mean, that was rough. And it was crazy because, and hopefully I can maybe share that video on our show notes, but I mean, it was like they had this rope around her just in case she didn't come back up. But the bottom line was it was hilarious. And the way she describes it is just priceless. And so I really, I would encourage you, she can be found online, especially at uh, Instagram. Her Instagram is amazing. You certainly should follow her at uh, Feed the Malik on Instagram. And you can see that among so many amazing stories that she's told over the years since I started following her. And so You know, I I had asked her to come on the podcast to do a couple of things. One, because she's here in Northwest Arkansas, she has a good understanding of what this area is all about, at least in her period of time that she's been here. And I think she can speak to it from the perspective of what other people might expect when they come to visit and or come to stay or call Northwest Arkansas home. And then beyond that, she's just living an amazing life. And so I thought, why not share her on our platform? I think you're going to enjoy this episode. So without further ado, Anella Malik, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's exciting to have you on finally. And uh, as I said, you get around so much. Every time I look up, I'm like, where is she now? But for the uninitiated, could you just give your Cliff Note superhero origin story of who Anella Malik is? <laughs> okay. That's very difficult. I feel like I've lived (laughs) 15 lives at this point, but my name is Anella Malik. I currently live in Northwest Arkansas in Bentonville, and I'm an influencer. I share stories about food and travel and anything else I'm interested in at the moment. So if you're taking a look at my work, you'll be like, oh, she's alternately, hopefully funny. I think I'm funny, but then very political. And you know, then I'm trying new things. And then I'm challenging myself to do things alone and really go out and face some of my fears. And then I'm back home doing very comfortable things, right? I share a broad swath of my life. And really my hope is to showcase to people that you can live a life that may that might be non-traditional, that may challenge what your parents thought you were going to do or what you thought you were going to do. This is not what I thought would be my career path but that you can still find joy and community wherever you go. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And, and I think that more than anything else is, is a message that a lot of people need to hear because too often we put ourselves in a box, right? We don't want to let family down. We don't want to let friends down. But ultimately, you have to live your best life. I mean, the operative word is your best life, not somebody else's. It has to be yours. So you are certainly doing that. What if anything compelled you to start Feed the Malik? So I actually, in my former career, I was a US diplomat and I had studied the Middle East, lived there, worked there. I speak Arabic and I uh, was serving in Jordan at the US embassy in Amman. And 
I, not to go too much into the, the nuances of the foreign service, but there are various career paths within the diplomatic service. And one of those is called public diplomacy. And public diplomacy involves things like making social media content, writing for public consumption. So writing remarks that are going to be read or heard by the public, creating videos, hosting events, actually very similar work to what I'm doing now. And I was a new officer and I felt like I could probably use some help figuring out what the heck I'm doing in this job. And so I started my platform as a way to build skills for that job. And I never really thought it would be anything. I never thought it would be a job. You know, I had this great career, so I didn't need to make money. I just got to explore. And I also used my platform as a way to kind of get out of the embassy bubble and to go to places that maybe all the other Americans didn't go to and practice my Arabic. I had spent so much money and so many years in school to learn Arabic that I wanted to use it. So that's how Feed Them Leaks started as an experiment, a hobby, and something that was really free, right? I didn't have to monetize it. I didn't really have any plans for it other than to learn and try new things. And then it grew and it grew <laughs> and it grew. And eventually I quit the foreign service. It just wasn't working for me and for my personal life and for what I wanted for myself. And I took a chance on making Feed the Mali a career. And I will say this because everyone's always like, oh, that's so brave. You must have had you know, such a, a good strategy. I didn't have a plan. <laughs> I just walked away one day and was like, well, I've been doing this other thing and I'll see if I can make some money. And I always knew that if it didn't work, I would just get another job. Yeah. And I, to pay for a part of school, I worked in restaurants for a long time. So that was my backup plan was if this doesn't work, I can walk into a restaurant down the street and get a job as a server tomorrow. And so it you know how to hustle. Be- <laughs> yeah. It might not be glamorous. Right. And you might not make a ton of money, but you can always get a job at a restaurant. And so that was my backup plan. And yeah. thankfully, I didn't have to exercise that and Feed Them Leak has worked. It really has. I mean, you know, and you're absolutely right. I mean, there is no influencer for dummies book out there to read. I mean, you literally have to, it's just trial and error. You have to learn by doing. And in the same way that you kind of ventured out to expand your palate, if you will, of understanding a foreign place, it's the same process with, you know, creating this platform that you've created uh, online, which I think is really cool. And then to add to it, I mean, as an influencer of color, I mean, how do you feel personally that your identity has shaped your experiences and more specifically the content that you create on Feed the Malik? Yeah. So, I would say that because my my content and my brand is so personal that you know everything is shaped by my own identity. And there's multiple layers of that identity, right? I grew up in the United States. I am an American woman, but I'm also a black woman. And I grew up, you know, surrounded by strong black figures that were really invested in making sure that I understood not only where I came from, but understood you know, the history and nuances of our culture and our community. And then on top of that, you know, my mom is Asian American. And um, I grew up with parents who always encouraged me to not only travel, but really encouraged me to be whatever I wanted to be. And I'm really grateful for that. You know, I always had to get good grades. (laughs) That was not negotiable in our household. But my parents were like, Oh, she's interested in dance. Okay, well, we'll, we'll see if she, that's something she wants to continue doing. And then, oh, she's interested in food. Okay. <laughs> and so they really nurtured that. And so all of those multi-layered like interests and identities play into my work. And definitely, right, I cover a lot of Black-owned businesses. I talk a lot about Black foodways. I actually wrote a book about Black food history for National Geographic, which should publish next year in 2025. What? Um, wait, 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 stop. I, you wrote a book? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you just threw that I, out there just kind of casually. I mean, because I don't I don't think I remember or maybe I may I may have missed the post where you announced that you were even working on a book, but I'm really not surprised. And I'm going off on a tangent here when I see other creators like the brother that did High on the Hog on Netflix. And, yeah. you no, know, I mean, there's there is. I mean, people are craving that information and that feedback. So, I mean, kudos to you for doing that. and. Connecting with a brand like National Geographic to do that is even is even more impressive. So congrats on that. I can't wait. I will be in line to buy that and uh, 
hopefully I'll be able to at least get it signed by you one day. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you. Honestly, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. I don't want to write another book, but who knows? I say that and then in a year I might be like, ah, I could do it again. Yeah. But I wrote a book about the deep and enduring contributions of Black peoples to American cuisine for National Geographic. And right. So like these are things that I'm interested in. They're part of my identity. I am a Black woman. I exist in this world as a Black woman. And especially in America, that really shapes not only your interactions with other people, but how you're perceived, right? Yeah. But then I also have a background in politics. So if you watch my content, sometimes I can be very political. And I think that surprises people because we like to think of influencers in our culture as one dimensional or, you know, simple or vapid when in reality, it's like or such safe. a complex. Or safe. Safe is or another word, right? Safe. And it's yeah. a very complex career. So the people who are making it work Typically, yeah, they have a lot going on. Well, I mean, I think as I've listened to other influencers talk, you have to be your true self, I think, at the end of the day. The reason why people gravitate towards influencers, a lot of influencers, is because they see themselves in those individuals in some way, shape, or form. But I think it's important not to, what can't be lost in that process is the individual. And I think it's important to recognize that there are just some people that aren't my cup of tea, but other people love them. I mean, I'm not a huge, I like Joe Rogan because of some of the amazing numbers he's put out as a podcaster. I like him. I'm not a big Joe Rogan fan though, but I've, I've enjoyed some of his content that he's put out, but I would say not a whole lot of it, but some of it. And I think that's the beauty of being in an influencer is that when you're comfortable in your own skin and you can just be who you are, Joe Rogan shouldn't change. You should keep doing what he's doing. Just like Anella Malik shouldn't change, you should keep doing what you're doing because there is there are people out there for every messenger. You just have to find your tribe. Yeah. And I I mean, I really agree. And I always tell people if you're really interested in having a creative career, and not just as an influencer, but in creative spaces in general, you have to have a strong sense of self. You are opening yourself up to criticism direction, you know, everyone else's input because you're sharing this creative project. And sometimes those critiques are well-intentioned. Other times, frankly, they're not. And ultimately, the thing that's going to make your work stand out in a sea of, you know, competition and in the influencer space, so many people want to be influencers now. You're not going to build a platform by just trying to be like everyone else. And so there is freedom in being like, I know who I am and I know what I want and I'm okay with that. And I'm okay with sharing that with the world, even if I'm not everyone's cup of tea. Yeah. No, I mean, listen, I agree wholeheartedly. I think even for my little bit of travel and also moving in the spaces of podcasting, I've had to find my voice and then I've had to try to stay true to it because I can't be all things to all people, even with this platform called I Am Northwest Arkansas, because I, I recognize that I may not be everyone's cup of tea, but I've gotten enough feedback to know that people like the information that I'm putting out, as well as the, the discourse that I'm able to have. So I'm just going to keep doing it. And, you know, whoever decides to listen, then God bless them. I'm, I'm so appreciative of that audience that I do have. Yeah, so, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Listen, you've traveled extensively. You've experienced a variety of cultures, both in your former job. But I'd love to know, as Feed the Malik, Feed the Malik, what have been some of the most impactful experiences you've had during your travels? And, and you've documented several that I can remember, but I'm just curious from your perspective, mm. what have been some of the most impactful? And you can just give us one or two that really stand out to you. Yeah. So of course, Antarctica, because I never thought I would go, <laughs> you know, like this is like the kind of stuff you read in magazines as a kid. And then yeah. you're like, that would be cool. And I just never thought it would happen for me. And so, and I think that Antarctica in particular is like that for a lot of people. When you're on an Antarctica trip, it is very common to look around and realize that multiple people are quietly crying. Wow. Because it's so overwhelming and it just doesn't seem real. And then when you're there, it's almost like you're looking around at this landscape and I've never seen anything like it. I was like, this feels like, it still feels like a movie. <laughs> so definitely Antarctica. And then beyond that, it's like the little things that stick with me when I travel, right? It's 
<laughs> like telling jokes late at night in Peru when I'm tired and really sweaty and stinky because I'm trekking the Inca Trail. Or the fact that <laughs> we would finish our trek every night and the company that I went with, right, they'd, they'd prepare our dinner. But we'd come off the trail and we're so stinky and we're so tired and they always had popcorn for us. <laughs> and that was like our post hike snack. It's like the, like, it's like they know, okay, dinner's not going to be ready. These people are hungry and tired. Like popcorn is social and it's like some, it's just like fun. And it's something that we can all have together. And I feel like the more I travel and I've been very, very privileged in my life, the more I realize that people are just people, right? And so, of course, like there's really cool food differences and linguistic differences and yes, cultural differences. But underneath most of that, it's like pretty, pretty much the same. Like people want to have fun. They like to tell jokes. They're usually very excited to see people enjoying their home or enjoying their food ways or, you know, enjoying learning about their culture. They want you to have a good time. And that's kind of it. Yeah. I mean, that, it sounds you make it sound super simple. And honestly, I, I believe it is. I, I did get a chance to spend some time traveling. I got to travel at, early on at a young age. and. I was always thankful to my father and my primarily my stepmom because she was a flight attendant with TWA for 35 years. And so I got to be a beneficiary to that. And, and to the point where I remember my, my mom having to do this whole thing to say that, yeah, she's partially responsible for me as well. She being my stepmom, who I'm still close to to this day. And, you know, and so I got to travel and I, you know, it would be nothing to go to Paris for the weekend or go to Germany or, going to Rome or, you know, places that you would, you, we would talk about in school. And here I was on a Friday afternoon rushing to John F. Kennedy airport to catch a flight over to experience something in real life, like going to the Coliseum and then coming back that next week and getting my film developed to show my classmates. And I mean, it, I don't know, there's just something about travel that I think everybody, I mean, travel should really be for everyone. Although I recognize that so many people never leave what is it? Uh, I don't know, the five square miles from where they grew up. Right. And so you have that aspect of it. And I just think the if more people got out and saw specifically what you've seen, they would have a, di a different appreciation for things and a different understanding of human interactions and just people of, of all walks of life. Yeah, I really think that the one lesson I've learned is that the world isn't as scary as we think it is. And yes, of course, like be smart, do your research, be a conscientious, aware traveler. But ultimately, it's not as scary as we think it is. And I think so much of the fears we have about other parts of the world and other people are just because we don't understand them. Yeah, it, it is true. And definitely, you sh should always do your due diligence and do your homework. But you know, also recognize that there's always going to be two stories about any place that you go to and visit. So with regard to your travel, and again, like I said, the whole Antarctica thing just kind of popped up on your feed. And I was like, oh my God, what's she doing down there? But how do you approach exploring and chronicling new places, right? I mean, like, is there a, a philosophy or uh, something that guides you with regard to that outside of the things that you definitely go out and check on? So you have chronicled, I mean, and you've made me think about or stop to say, hey, I have to make plans to go to this food festival or to go to this place. And living in, I have lived in D.C. for four years while I was in school at Howard. And, you know, I and mean, you've talked about different spots in D.C. that I'm like, I've never been there. I got to go to that place. But what guides you from a philosophical standpoint when it comes to you going out and surveying the world? Yeah, so... First and foremost, I'm always interested in exploring food. I'm one of those people who will get on a plane for a meal, which I know seems absolutely ridiculous, but you know, I've long realized that the way I orient my budget is around my values. And so new experiences and new food, I will spend all the money on, but I'm also the person who has literally one pair of jeans <laughs> <laughs> because to me, it's not important. So right. definitely food. And then when I'm thinking about chronicling my adventures and what I want to share, I really try to start from the standpoint of recognizing that the things that I am privileged enough to do now, many people don't have the opportunity to do. And so what I try to do is make my trips and my experiences as accessible as possible. Even if you know some of that stuff isn't like the sexiest content, it might not be the most viral content. 
But for example, if you look at my Antarctica content, I have two videos about how to get there because it's so far away and it just seems like so difficult to imagine that I understand that like explaining how to get there is really important for people yeah. to then understand or at least consider like, is this something that could potentially be a reality for them? Or similar things like I've spent a lot of time in the Middle East and I often share about the Middle East. And I think to myself, okay, like this is a place that it's pretty far. A lot of people have not had the opportunity to go to. So in my YouTube video about Jordan, I talk about what it's like to arrive at the airport there because I know that airport so well. I've flown in and out of that airport dozens and dozens of times, but like people want to know how to get a taxi when they get there. It's safe to get in a taxi when they get there. How can they get cash, right? These are like very basic questions. And yeah, it might not be the sexiest content, but I feel like I try to cover those like little things, those little details, because it makes travel seem so much more realistic for people. And then they can consider if this is really a place that they would want to try to go. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And you did recently do a post about Jordan and your travels there. And obviously you talked about the time that you spent there and everything from the flight over the nonstop flight from Dulles to Amman, I believe. And then uh, you talked about the underground art scene. You talked about some really cool meals that you had out in the desert. I mean, it was just, I mean, you, I felt like I was there with you, even though I wasn't. And so I think you do a really good job of chronicling your experiences, you know, with, with the boots on the ground. And so, I mean, I, I certainly applaud you for that. And I would encourage anybody listening that if, Anella has been to a place that you want to go. It's a good chance that she will get you psyched up to think that you could probably do it just by following <laughs> some of her feeds on Instagram. And, you know, the beauty of it, too, is that her site is so and when I say site, I mean, she's on the Instagram platform, but it's so well put together that you can go through her reels and just read each reel to see what it's about. And it, it's almost like a timeline of different things and places that she's been that you can kind of follow along and walk a few steps in her footsteps and, and just kind of experience what she's experienced. So, and, you know, again, I applaud you for kind of taking that and growing not just your influence, but your audience, right? Because I remember when you first got here, I think I, because of course, you know, as an influencer myself, and I don't have a lot of followers on Instagram because that's not my main platform, but I, first thing I always do is look to see how many people are following this person. Well, who's, who's actually listening to this person? I, I think you had under 100,000 at the time, and now you're like up to maybe 170,000 and growing and continuing to grow. And I mean, that's, that's huge. I mean, that's just for reference sake. I mean, just think of it this way. Some television, some local t programming and television stations don't get as, as many eyeballs on the content that they're creating as Anella does on her site, Feed the Malik. So, and that, that goes for any influencer, right? That has another, a number of eyeballs. I have some other friends here locally, like Henry Washington, who is a real estate influencer and a few others that are above a hundred thousand followers on Instagram. And it's impressive because, you know, you have found a platform that works for you and you go all in, in terms of providing high quality content. And so, you know, I mean, that's, just kudos to you for doing that. And I, I've got my popcorn and I'm just going to sit idly by and watch you as you continue to grow this, grow this thing. So that's exciting. So I want to talk to you specifically about Northwest Arkansas, because I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the place where we are. You, you are living here now. You've had a unique experience with Northwest Arkansas. I remember you originally moved here, then you moved to Portland, then you came back to Northwest Arkansas. And I was really excited to see when I heard the news that you were moving back here. But what has Northwest Arkansas meant to you? And more specifically, what do you think about Northwest Arkansas now that you've had, I mean, with all of your other experiences around the world, you know, where does Northwest Arkansas sit on that strata, if you will, of places that you've visited, places that you've experienced, and obviously you've lived here? Yeah. So cumulatively, I've been here almost two years now. Okay. Just in two separate periods, as you mentioned. and. I think Northwest Arkansas is a really special place. So first and foremost, the reason I came back after moving to Portland was because I really like the community here. I felt like there's a sense of, I don't know, closeness here with the people that I've met. 
And maybe it's the lifestyle, you know, like going on long bike rides together. And I live in Bentonville where my, a lot of my friends live walking distance from my house. And so I think there's a sense of like, what's it called? There was this article I read about how one thing adult friendships lack often in comparison to, you know, the friendships we make in our youth is Mm -hmm. unstructured playtime. And I actually think that in Arkansas, we do get that because of the emphasis on uh, sports here, on spending time outdoors. And if you live like in one of the downtowns and you have a community nearby, you're close enough to people that you can pop over and be like, I'm coming over in 15 minutes. So I think that's a really special part of living here. And I think the region as a whole has a lot to offer, right? If you look at from North to South and you consider it as a region, I think Northwest Arkansas does have a lot to offer. It's fast growing. There's solid food here. You know, there's lots of recreation. There's tons of events. I feel like we are over-programmed for events for a population of this size. There's like 10 things happening every night. And I really enjoy that about living here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd say Northwest Arkansas is definitely experiencing some growing pains. And that's something that I'm curious to see how that will play out here in the future. But coming from a big city, those kinds of growing pains are happening everywhere, right? The housing crisis is not, it's not unique to one place. Everywhere is struggling to figure out how do we plan and build and account for the fact that people need affordable housing? What does that mean for the local housing market? So I think like, like DC, which I've also lived in and loved, Northwest Arkansas has its flaws, but I do reject when people talk about (laughs) issues here as if they only exist here. Oh yeah, absolutely. No, without a doubt. And that's the thing. I mean, I've had a perspective too, and I get it and no place is perfect, right? I mean, you have to make, you have to make of it what you want it to be and it's going to have its flaws. It's going to have its blemishes, but that could be the same could be said for any place including DC, but I love DC and DC with all, all of its challenges. I still love DC. And every time I go back there, I'm just like, oh my gosh, I love it here. And partly because I went to school there and spent my formative years growing from a youth to adult. But I mean, it's, you know, each each place is going to have its own impact on an individual. And certainly uh, I'm sure that Northwest Arkansas has had an impact on you as you continue to progress in your career. So listen, I want to ask you a question and, you know, I don't know what your plans are, but what are you hoping, you know, what would you advise aspiring influencers, anybody that may be following you or people that want to do what you've done? What advice would you give them for someone starting out as an influencer, especially somebody that might be, might feel maybe a little underrepresented in the digital space, right? Because that, that is a lot of times you don't want to do something unless you see somebody else doing it like you, that looks like you. And so I'd be interested to get your thoughts on that and what advice that you would give. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you have to be willing to fail publicly to be an influencer. Yes. That is the very first thing. And if you're not good at that, and if you don't like that, then uh, maybe this isn't the career for you. So much of this industry is still uncharted. Every day, platforms shift, they change. And all that you're really doing as an influencer is running experiments constantly. If you look back through my content over the last year, you'll see vastly different video styles, video lengths. I've you know done multiple series, like all sorts of things because it's one big experiment, right? Yeah. And you have to be willing to fail. Projects are going to bomb. You are going to be criticized. You're going to get input from people that you've never asked for their input, (laughs) which is always (laughs) grading. And that's just part of doing this as a job. But I will say, if you really feel like you have something to say, then don't be deterred, right? This is an industry where I think the people I know who I'm like watching, I'm like, they're going to do well are people who have something to say that they're passionate about, that they're really interested in. And that is a really beautiful thing that you can take, you know, something that's, that, that's been your, maybe your little hobby or your, you know, your very private area of interest and turn it into something bigger. And of course, you have to have a very thick skin. You have to know who you are and be willing to let people tell you that who you are is wrong because they will. 
And that's also part of, you know, being a public figure and opening up your work to a broader audience. Yeah, no, I, I mean, that's, that is great advice. And certainly, you know, it's so funny because I've actually gotten ideas for creating some videos from some of the videos that you've created. So, you know, as they say, there's nothing new under the sun, but sometimes if you just become observant about what other people are doing around you, not that you have to copy, copycat anybody, but, you know, imitation is a serious form of flattery. And you can pick up a lot from a lot of other influencers that are doing really cool things. You may not be Mr. or Mrs. Beast right away, but just and maybe just, maybe you don't want to be Mr. Beast. No, exactly. You can still exactly. Learn from him. Yeah, right? yeah. I have no desire to ever be Mr. Beast. The type of content he creates and his platform to me is not appealing. However, yeah. I can still watch his videos and learn something from his video production team. Right. And though his team, you don't get to that level without being experts in the data. And a lot of, I think their content decisions are driven by that expertise. And so maybe you don't want to be Mr. Beast, but you can watch his videos and learn quite a bit. Yeah, no, absolutely. And one of the biggest takeaways I've ever taken from Mr. Beast is the importance of a high quality thumbnail, almost an image, you know, like they say, a picture is worth a thousand words, but the image that you you used to compel somebody to want to even click on it or touch that image to see more is important. And like I was mentioning earlier about how you've kind of set up your reels, I, th- I think is genius. And I've seen a lot of other people doing that to get more interaction with the end user. And so, I mean, there's, there's a lot that can be learned. Certainly. I just think um, as an influencer or someone that's coming up through the ranks, you really just have to be observant about what's going on around you and that will help inform you. And then follow a couple of people like Anella or others that, you know, are, are doing it at a high level and, and doing a good job of it. Right. And even in the sense publicly failing, but then dusting themselves off and you know, pushing something else out that is of, of a high quality and uh, you just have to keep trying. I mean, I tell people all the time, my first couple of podcasts sucked. They were terrible. And then after, you know, I don't know how many, but, you know, now it's like it's easy, but it, it took a while for me to get to where I am today, as I'm sure it took you a while to feel comfortable telling a certain type of story or being able to leverage those types of stories that you tell, regardless of where you were going and where you were telling them. Yeah, no, definitely. My first videos were terrible, folks. So. <laughs> <laughs> Are any of those still up or did you take them down? Oh, I think if you scroll back, they're still Okay, up. so they're still there. Okay, that's good. Yeah, and even some of my friends that have been podcasting for more than a decade now still have, they always keep their first ones out there just so that people know and say, hey, I was, I was like you at one point and I, you know, I went through some of those challenges. So mm-hmm. I would encourage people to check that out. Could you, I mean, what's next for Feed the Malik? And are there any upcoming projects or destinations that you're particularly excited about? Okay, so I am expanding onto YouTube this year, which is a huge undertaking and something I've wanted to do for a long time, but I didn't because I was writing a book and then I was editing the book and then I was moving. And so I'm the type of person, if I want to do something, I'm all in. I don't do things halfway. And so I'm expanding onto YouTube. I'm doing long form there. There's a couple videos up. There's Antarctica and Jordan. And the response so far has been incredible. It's going to be a long, probably slow and steady climb on YouTube. But to me, feels like the most fun I've had in a long time. So I'm good at Instagram. And I say that like without any ego, it is my primary platform. It's where I make the majority of my income. But the nature of Instagram means that I have to cut so much from these projects because I have to make these videos under 60 seconds if I want people to actually watch them. Yeah. And that's the audience you have on Instagram. And f- for me, as someone who, you know, I might go to a place for two weeks, three weeks, making a bunch of 60 second videos, it just feels like so much gets cut out. And mm-hmm. so much gets cut out that I think is useful and interesting and like can help people who might want to go to this place or might want to try this thing. And so YouTube has been a really fun expansion because I get to take all that stuff that I used to have to cut out. And now I have the space to try to leave it in. So YouTube is the big one. It's my big focus. As a storyteller, it feels great to have the opportunity to try something new. Yep. And then on top of that, I made goals for myself this year that really have nothing to do with work. 
I want to spend more time with friends and family, however that happens. And I've been pretty creative so far. It's only February about making that happen. I brought my oldest best friend with me on a trip to Turkey, right? And that's like trying to be creative and recognize that the life I lead is kind of wild and I'm all over the place. But how do I make intentional spaces for the people I care about within that? So I think I've done a lot about traveling alone and doing things alone. It's still a huge part of my life. I love solo travel. I am the solo girl. I will go to a bar by myself and sit, have a cocktail, enjoy my evening. But I think this year, I'll be sharing more about making space for other people on those adventures as well. Yeah, I love that. That sounds like fun. And, and is, so is that youtube.com forward slash feed the Malik? Unfortunately, it- someone had Feed the Malik, which is oh, man. wild. So it's youtube.com forward slash at feed underscore the underscore Malik. Um, oh, and I can man. send it to you so we can put it in the show notes. Yeah, we will definitely put that in the show notes. <laughs> I want everybody to check it out. Now I want to go on and see the complete episode of Antarctica because I actually, as I was watching that and I showed it to my wife, I was like, man, I said, I've been, I so wanted, I want to get a plunge pool in my backyard just for, you know, or just one of those you know, above ground things just so I could take, you know, cold, you know, that the ice bath and all that. Mm. But, you know, watching you do that, I was just like, I was just, I was encouraged. So yeah, I definitely want to see the whole video so I can see the full, because I'm sure you shot it in 4k and I'm sure it looks amazing. So yeah, you can watch it on your TV. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I will definitely do that. I will definitely do that. So I got two, two questions for you before we, we end this up. And this has been a really great conversation. I appreciate you taking this time, but And we talked a little bit about it. The fact that some of the money that you earn is through the collaboration with some of your brands. How do you balance staying true to your voice and values while engaging your audience and working with those brands, right? Because I mean, you know, everybody's different. Every brand is different about what they want you to say or what they will not let you say. So how do you work that into your process and are there certain things that you tell brands, hey, I'm just not willing to do this or I'm not willing to do that? Or how does that work? I say no all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that just comes from knowing yourself and knowing your voice. And it does yeah. take time to develop that like real sense of like, oh, no, this doesn't feel right. But in my work with brands, right, I say no to the vast majority of partnerships that come my way. And frankly, every full-time influencer I know who's working with brands regularly is doing the same, right? You have to have some level of discernment to protect your relationship with your audience. Yeah. And then beyond that, it's a negotiation, right? So we'll come to an agreement. They'll send a brief, you know, outlining what they want. And it is not uncommon to message back and say, hey, this part of the brief doesn't work for me because it doesn't sound authentic or like it's just not how I would talk. And I will say the vast majority of brand partners are fine with that because they're hiring you because they like your voice, right? And I think you do yourself a disservice if you operate in this space and are unafraid to speak up. Like you, you have to politely push back. And that is part of being a freelancer. That's part of, you know, just running a business is learning how to say no in many ways. (laughs) Yeah. No, that, I, I like that to politely push back. And that is it certainly is food for thought and something for any aspiring influencer to consider. Don't sell your soul just for a paycheck. And, and also, and, I promise you what they're offering you is not enough to sell your soul. Right. You will it, see when you start paying ta- the taxes you pay as <laughs> someone who's self-employed and paying your own overhead that y- it is not enough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Stop. Absolutely. No, you're absolutely right. And then my final question to you is this, actually the final, the second to last question, how have you navigated the ever changing landscape of social media? And I'm sure this would be of interest to anyone that's Mm -hmm. an aspiring influencer. And also what trends do you think will shape the future of content creation? And I'm sure AI plays a role in that because it has impacted what I do every week with a podcast, believe it or not. But I'd be curious to know how the changing landscape has impacted you and how are you navigating that? Yeah. So I think one of my keys to longevity in the industry is by making sure I really am an expert, right? And so that means running experiments on my own account, playing with things, you know, being willing to fail, but then also keeping up with industry news. You know, I subscribe to a variety of industry newsletters. I listen to 
social media marketing and influencer podcasts, I make sure that I'm doing the work. And a lot of that work is unsexy. I'm sitting at my computer, you know, I'm listening to these things, I'm taking notes, I'm trying to see if I'm seeing these trends that experts are talking about when I'm browsing social media as a user. That's really how you're going to stay up to date. So that's one. And then the being willing to try new things, you know, approach also extends to new platforms. So I'm on TikTok, you know, I'm on threads, and maybe those platforms won't be your primary platforms, but you should have a general understanding of how they operate because we all saw how TikTok impacted the social media sphere more broadly, right? Even outside of TikTok with the introduction of Reels, the pivot to video on most platforms, all of these things. And then to the second half of your question, I actually think this is the most important question. You know, what do I see changing moving forward? What do I see as the big trends? Well, the introduction of AI is fascinating and it's something I'm playing with, but I really see AI as being a tool to streamline certain processes, but not it's not going to take the place of your authentic voice, right? I can use AI to help me rewrite scripts, but if I ask it to just generate a script, it's not going to get me where I need to go. And so I think it's actually becoming far more important even than it used to be for creators to have a distinct, authentic voice. That's what's going to set you apart, especially since as many more creators are starting to experiment with AI, you know, AI is much better at generating a listicle seven things to try in Buenos Aires. And it's just a list of those seven things. That's pretty easy. It's pretty low hanging fruit. And I think we're going to see a lot of content like that as people are trying to cut corners and you having an authentic voice, maybe talking about your experience in Buenos Aires, you talking about how you felt when you were there, your your favorite part of your trip. That's going to be what makes your content unique and useful and engaging when you're competing with a whole bunch of people that are doing AI generated listicles. Yeah, you you said it, I mean, 100%. And I think that the thing that just hearing you mention that is it's really important. And I've heard a lot of people talk about the importance of understanding your lane when it comes to utilizing AI. I use it to augment some of the work that I do, but I mean, certainly, yeah, I I technically have AI set up to where if I have to edit a podcast, I can, you know, if I say a word wrong, I can re-edit it with my own voice, which is crazy. But I don't, I wouldn't then take a tray, I wouldn't then take like write out a transcript and then say AI, okay, just record that for me. Because it wouldn't be me. It wouldn't really have the nuance and inflection of my voice. And it wouldn't capture the essence of who I am as a communicator, as a podcaster. In the same way, it wouldn't necessarily capture the essence of your ability to tell a story, even in a short form in 60 seconds or in a long format. So I think we're still a ways away from that. And imitation may be the sincerest form of flattery. In an AI world, that may become a much different conversation. And so I, I think it's, it's just going to remain to be seen that uh, how AI does impact content creation. And I will say this, and you probably agree with this, everybody should really learn how to write. Everybody should learn how to critically think and how to read and conceptualize ideas and then distribute and share those ideas, both in written form and in spoken form. And so I think there is no replacement of that. But I do think AI will, you know, you could ignore it at your own, at your peril, but understand it more so than anything else and continue to perfect your own craft, whatever that may be. Do you yeah, agree with definitely. that? I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. I mean, that's, I think we've, we've put it all out there. Anella, I, I really, really do appreciate you sharing your thoughts about your experience as an influencer, as a creator. Thank you again, just personally. I know we've, I've run into you a number of times. I've seen, I've run into you on an airplane, of course, where, where else would you run into a travel <laughs> influencer, but on an airplane, but you know, I've, I've, I've seen her all over and out and about and just certainly appreciate how you kind of came into this community and and quickly became a part of it. And certainly we are all rooting for you and this is always going to be home for you. So just know that we will leave the light on for you, no matter where you decide to go or, or how far flung of in far flung parts of the world you decide to visit, 
you can always come back to Northwest Arkansas and know that you have a home here. And certainly, like you said about community, it's real. And that's one thing that I say over and over again on this podcast. And I've been here nine years now that the community in Northwest Arkansas is very special. And uh, I would put it up against most of the other places that I've lived throughout this country. So, and, and, you know, warts and all, it's a good place to be. So, you know, take it for what it's worth, but thank you so much. If anybody wants to get in contact with you in any way, shape or form, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Yeah. So definitely check out my Instagram. It's where, you know, it's still my digital home. Right. So you can find me at Feed the Malik there and definitely on YouTube, which we'll link in the show notes. And then if you're browsing any of my platforms, my contact information, if you want to shoot me an email or something like that, will always be in my bio. Yeah. Well, and we'll put all of that in the show notes so that everybody can reach out to Anella and, you know, certainly connect with her on on Instagram as well. Just follow follow her on Instagram and definitely check out some of her exploits. I, I would say that you'll enjoy it. It's, it's really, really high quality content from an individual that I, I have a lot of respect and regard for. So Anella Malik, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the I Am Northwest Arkansas podcast. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. Absolutely. Well, folks, there you have it. Another episode of the I Am Northwest Arkansas podcast to learn more about us or to read or download the show notes from today's episode visit IamNorthwestArkansas.com. You can listen to this podcast and sign up for our free newsletter to keep up with us and all things NWA. Make sure you sign up today. You can also subscribe to the I Am Northwest Arkansas podcast wherever you listen to it. And please, please, please consider rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts. Remember, our podcast comes out every Monday, rain or shine. I'm your host, Randy Wilburn, and we'll see you back here next week for another new episode of the I Am Northwest Arkansas podcast. Peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. Check us out each and every week available anywhere that great podcasts can be found. For show notes or more information on becoming a guest, visit IamNorthwestArkansas.com. We'll see you next week on I Am Northwest Arkansas.